This video is made possible by Indochino. I got this tailor-made and sharp-looking suit from Indochino, and you can too. Just go to Indochino.com, use the promo code BRAINFOOD, and get a premium suit for just $379 with free shipping. More on them in a bit. The term peeping tom is used to describe a person who derives some sort of enjoyment, usually sexual, from secretly watching people during their most intimate moments. But who exactly is this tom fellow, and why does everyone seem to think that he likes secretly watching naked people? The phrase peeping tom first appeared in the accounts for the English city of Coventry in 1773. Specifically, the accounts note that the city had recently purchased a wig and paint for an oak effigy of Peeping Tom using money from the town's coffers. So, well, who is the effigy of? Well, actually, it was of no real person. Peeping Tom is an iconic part of a legend surrounding a real person from the 11th century called Lady Godiva. The legend states that Lady Godiva once rode through the city streets on horseback, totally naked, in protest of her husband's unfair taxation of the populace. While exact circumstances surrounding this now mythical ride change depending on which source you consult, the general story is that Lady Godiva asked her husband on behalf of the town to lower taxes. Her husband, knowing his wife's chaste nature, joked that he would lower taxes if she agreed to ride naked through the streets. Lady Godiva, much to the surprise of her husband, accepted this offer and appealed to the townspeople to avert their gaze as she did the deed. The lady being popular with her subjects, unlike her husband, meant that the townspeople dutifully locked their windows and doors, and Lady Godiva rode proudly through the streets atop a white stallion with only her long, flowing locks covering her wobbly bits. She then returned to her husband, and true to his word, he lowered taxes for the town. While Lady Godiva, meaning gift of God, and her husband, the enormously wealthy Leofric, Earl of Mercia, most certainly did exist, as you've probably guessed, even without supporting facts, historians are in near universal agreement that this ride never happened. To begin with, the first known reference to the famous ride appeared some two centuries after the lady in question died, first mentioned in the book Flowers of History, written by one Roger of Wendover. Although Roger claimed to have gleaned the contents of his book from, to quote, the books of Catholic writers worthy of credit, his version of the legend of Lady Godiva's ride, which featured knights flanking her and a gathered crowd, rather than people boarding up their windows and letting the lady pass in pieces, is considered to be nothing more than a fabrication of an unsourced anecdote that survived from Lady Godiva's lifetime. Over the years, this story was taken as fact, and numerous embellishments were added, leading to the versions that we know today. Where exactly the legend of this ride came from is even more perplexing, given that, according to every contemporary source from her time, Lady Godiva and her husband Leofric were notable philanthropists who frequently gave money, golds, and even buildings to the church, and once even paid for the building of a monastery in Coventry. Another factor that confuses historians about the origin of the legend of Godiva's naked ride is the fact that, as noted in the Doomsday Book of 1086, a comprehensive record of most every notable person in England and their holdings written likely within a decade of the lady's death, Lady Godiva was in her lifetime one of the few women in the entire country to be a landowner controlling a number of large estates around Coventry and the surrounding area. This makes it highly unlikely that she would have needed to appeal to her husband to lower taxes taxes, as she owned much of the city, and thus would have been the person responsible for setting taxes in Coventry, not her husband. So where does Peeping Tom come into all of this? Well, the short answer is that he doesn't, or at least he didn't, until sometime around the 17th or 18th century. The legend of Godiva's ride remained basically the same as the one previously mentioned until around the 1700s, when some versions began mentioning a man eventually named Tom. According to these newer versions of the legend, while nearly every townsperson dutifully complied with Lady Godiva's wishes to avert their eyes as she rode through the town, Tom the tailor couldn't resist catching Catching a glimpse of the lady in the buff, and so drilled a hole in his shutters to watch her ride by. Tom's fate differs depending on the version of the legend you read, but most claim that he was either killed or blinded. 
The reasons for either eventuality range from Tom being struck blind by Godiva's beauty, killed by God for ignoring Godiva's request, the lady in question being explicitly named as beloved by God in the earliest forms of the legend, or simply being beaten half to death and blinded by the rest of the townspeople when they found out. Either way, Tom is a modern embellishment of a story of the legend, with no mention of him in any version of the legend for nearly half a millennium after its creation. Another thing pointing to Tom, at least as a named character, being a relatively modern invention, is that the name Thomas is not Anglo-Saxon. Tom was, however, a common moniker for a generic man since around the 15th or 16th century in England, which is likely why this particular character was eventually given this name. It isn't known when exactly he acquired the name Tom or what he was originally called. The first documented instance of the character being called Tom didn't occur until June 11, 1773, when the Coventry Annals mentioned the aforementioned wig and paint for the character's effigy. In any event, in the late 17th century, the people of Coventry began reenacting the Lady's Ride as an annual town event. The Godiva procession has been happening in the town since 1677 or 1678 and is still celebrated, albeit sporadically, today. It generally involves an actress riding through the town on horseback, sometimes naked, sometimes not, depending on the sensibilities of the time. Unlike in the legends, the people of Coventry gleefully watch and celebrate the ride. Within about half a century of the start of the Godiva procession tradition, with the exact date unknown, the people of the town created the aforementioned effigy of Tom, which still exists today, giving us our first definitive mentions of the character. One potential origin story for the character of Tom has been suggested via the journals of three soldiers who visited Coventry in the early 17th century. From the text, it isn't clear whether they are referring to a peeping Tom figure when mentioning Wanton or Leofric himself. If the former, this would be the first known reference to a peeping Tom in the story. Importantly, they also mention seeing a painting of Lady Godiva's ride, which is thought to be a 1586 work that shows a man in a window looking down upon the nude lady as she rode. This man's presence in the painting was only rediscovered in 1976 after the painting was cleaned and he once again became visible. The soldiers and others from this time may well have mistook this man for being a random peeping Tom when, in fact, the man shown is Leofric himself, observing his wife's lonely procession from a window. Whatever the case, over the years, the phrase Peeping Tom became synonymous with the act of watching someone without their knowledge, as well as another way to call someone a pervert. The phrase was first defined in the classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue, written in 1796 as a nickname for a curious, prying fellow. So there you have it. Peeping Tom was not a real person, but a 17th century legend attached to a legend about an 11th century noblewoman that, despite having no basis in fact, persists today in popular culture because it involves a famous woman who, rumor had it, got naked in public. Apparently, people back then weren't so different to how we are today. But good news, you don't need to be naked in public, because you can check out today's sponsor, Indochino. Yes, indeed, this fine jacket is thanks to Indochino. I got this tailor-made, in fact, I got a whole suit tailor-made from Indochino, and you can do it as well. Just go to Indochino.com, use the promo code BRAINFOOD, and you'll get a premium suit. Definitely go premium, you're a premium person, for just $379 with free shipping. Now, I'd happily wear this jacket as a separate, but go on and get the full suit with our code. You can split it up later if you want. Now, if you've ever worn stuff that's tailor-made before, you know what's up with tailor-made. And if you haven't, well, I'll just tell you that it's better. Maybe you've got, you know, really small wrists or giant legs or short arms, whatever. With a tailor-made suit, it's always gonna fit better. And that's fine, but it also makes you look better. And even if you are a totally average-sized person, a tailored suit is going to fit and look better than something off the rack. A well-fitted suit it changes your image. It doesn't matter how much a suit costs if it doesn't fit right. Fit is more important than brand, and Indochino gets it fitted perfectly every time because, of course, it's made to your measurements. If you're in the US, you can go to a showroom. There are a lot of them and get it fitted. Or if you're not like me, just measure yourself at home. It's not difficult. Plus, you get to design it yourself and choose all the little details. I've even got a little monogram right inside here. Just go to Indochino.com and use the promo code BRAINFOOD and get a premium suit, $379 with free shipping. And let's get into today's bonus fact. 
Speaking of phrases and wobbly bits, let us now enlighten you about buttock mail, which is the lesser-known cousin of blackmail. As for the latter, blackmail has its roots in the early 16th century, first used by English farmers living on the England-Scotland border. It derives from the Middle English word mail, which is thought to derive itself from the Old English word mal. In Old English, mal is described as thus, lawsuit, terms, bargaining, agreement. Over time, the word mal became mail, which in Middle English roughly translated to either rent or tribute. As such, the rent paid by a farmer living on the Scottish border was known as silver rent or mail because it was normally paid in silver. This gave rise to white money or white rent and eventually white mail. When Scottish chieftains and various brigands noticed all these well-to-do farmers going about their business without someone threatening them for money, they decided to start threatening them for money. In return, what did the farmers get? Well, their land wouldn't be raised and their livestock destroyed. Those forcing the tribute would also then offer their protection to the farmers from others who might want to try something similar. Farmers almost immediately began referring to this secondary rent that they were being forced to pay as black rents, which, if you've been paying attention, was then called black mail. Etymologists aren't sure where the black part of blackmail came from. Seemingly, the most obvious hypothesis is due to the connotations black had with evil. But the most obvious answer and the correct one aren't necessarily the same, and lacking direct evidence, many other hypotheses have popped up. The most probable one of the bunch is by Charles Mackay in the Dictionary of Lowland Scots from 1888, who claimed it derived from the Gaelic blaich, meaning to protect, so protection rent. Somewhat less plausible hypotheses include that it was because a farmer's raided livestock would be sold off on the black market, that if it wasn't paid, your farm would be raided at night by individuals dressed in black, or that it was purely because all Scottish raiders demanded their payment in black cows. Needless to say, we can probably safely disregard the latter three proposed ideas. Whatever the case, in 1814, the Scottish playwright Sir Walter Scott gave the world perhaps the most detailed explanation of what blackmail back in those days entailed. In Scott's historical novel Waverley, blackmail, written then as black hyphen mail, is described as follows. A sort of protection money that low country gentlemen and heritors lying near the Highlands pay to some Highlands chief that he may neither do them harm himself nor suffer it to be done to them by others. Scott also mentions that if a person paying this protection money comes to harm or suffered a loss at the hands of another raider, the person they were paying would endeavor to cover their losses, usually by stealing replacements from someone who wasn't paying them protection money. Whether this led to a hilarious situation in which two warring Scottish chiefs ended up continually stealing and then replacing a farmer's sheep isn't known, but in the interest of making history more fascinating than it already generally is, we're going to assume that this absolutely happened. We're likewise going to assume that while it was happening, the farmers played the Benny Hill theme, aka Yachty Sax. The fact that this song wasn't composed until the 1960s and the saxophone not invented until the 1840s is neither here nor there. And by the way, if you want to listen to a story about an incredibly fascinating person, go check out our video titled The Surprisingly Badass Life of the Inventor of the Saxophone. So this all brings us to yet another form of mail that was popular around the 16th century through the 19th. That, purely for its amusing sounding nature, we'd like to bring back into common usage in some form or another, and that is buttock mail. Given what you now know of mail, if you guessed that buttock mail was some form of payment in order to keep things quiet about you're having a good time with someone's buttock, you actually wouldn't be that far off. In fact, in Scotland, buttock mail was a sort of tax introduced in 1595, which was enforced by the church courts. Essentially, if you had sex outside of wedlock, often with a prostitute, hence the buttock part, which was slang for prostitute, and you were a Presbyterian in Scotland, you would often be given the choice of the stool of repentance or paying buttock mail to stop from having to stand on a stool in front of everyone and get berated by your local minister for your lustful actions. While the latter perhaps doesn't sound so bad to modern thinking compared to having to pay a hefty tax to keep things quiet, without the option of buttock mail, or if one couldn't afford it, people are known to have killed themselves rather than have to face the stall of repentance and the fornicator label that would follow them around in the aftermath. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also, why not check out our fantastic sponsor Indochino special discount link below. And as always, Thank you for watching.